Ladies and gentlemen, if you can take your seats. My name is Scott Silliman, and among other things, I guess I'm a conference marshal. But uh, this is our third panel of the conference, and the last one of, of the day. Uh, and the title of this particular panel is Military Cooperation and Questions of Law. I submit to you that in dealing with the United States and Canada, two countries which I think oftentimes find themselves aligned together uh, in a coalition of nations where the use of force is either contemplated or actually used, possible issues might arise regarding how each country interprets international law. And, and to give you a further definition of what I'm talking about, uh, I'm specifically referring to that part of international law that we call the USIM Bella, uh, which is the, the rules governing how much force and what type of force can be used in armed conflict. And that's to be distinguished from what we call the USAD Bella, which is the overall question of the legality of force, one sovereign against another. Uh, this possible conflict, though, uh, for example, might arise in situations such as the United States uh, has signed but not ratified the 1977 Additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions. Uh, Canada has signed and ratified that treaty. And uh, under the protocol, Protocol 1, there is a definite enlargement of the category of lawful belligerents by uh, affording legal recognition to certain types of guerrilla activity by modifying the requirements for uh, distinctive emblems and carrying arms openly, and that's one of the reasons the United States has not chosen to ratify it. Further, under the additional protocol, I think there is arguably greater clarity on what is or is not a lawful military target. Uh, and again, I think the United States prefers there to be a, a bit of ambiguity, uh, as is set aside by the 49 Convention. Uh, another example, uh, Canada has signed and ratified the 1977 Ottawa Convention on the Prohibition of the Use, Stockpiling, Production, and Transfer of Anti-Personnel Mines. The United States is not a party to that convention. As a matter of fact, chose not to even be a party to the negotiations. But interestingly, under its own policy, the United States has said that uh, it believes it should be able to use such weapons, especially in North Korea, but has set a timeline uh, for the ultimate uh, doing away of the use of such weapons, but totally apart from and outside the treaty. What about the application of military force in the war on terrorism? I think perhaps even more basic question, how does the United States define terrorism? How does Canada define terrorism? I suspect that the two countries are not necessarily in accord on how we view what terrorism is. And finally, although we're going to have a separate panel on it, the last panel of the conference tomorrow, on the International Criminal Court, uh, it is well known that Canada uh, is a proponent of the International Criminal Court, signed it, uh, ratified it. The United States has vehemently fought against it. And although we, quote, signed it on the last day of open for signature, uh, employing Article 18 of the Vienna Convention, uh, we released or were released from our obligation uh, under that particular treaty. And as many of you know, the Congress of the United States uh, passed an act called the American Servicemen's Protection Act, which, among other things, uh, allows for the use of force, military force, to uh, extricate an American serviceman who is being held on charges by the court. To discuss these issues and many others of different interpretations of law and how they affect military cooperation, we try to bring together a panel of experts, and they really are experts. Let me introduce them to you now in the order in which they'll be speaking. Bill Fenrick has been a senior legal advisor in the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia for the last 10 years, where he's provided international law advice to the Office of the Prosecutor and argued at both the trial and at the appellate levels, particularly on matters reflecting, uh, related to conflict, classification, and command responsibility. Of interest to many of us, though, uh, Bill was the main author of the report to the prosecutor on the 1999 
NATO bombing campaign against Yugoslavia. He served as a military lawyer in the Canadian forces from 1974 until 1994, specializing in law of war and operational law matters. He's published widely on law of war matters, and his publications have been cited not only by the International Criminal Court or the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, uh, but also by the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, next speaking will be Marco Sassoli, who has just joined the faculty at the University of Geneva in Switzerland, where he now holds a chair in public international law. Uh, from 2001 until just last month, he was a professor of law at the University of Quebec in Montreal, and prior to that, he worked for 13 years for the International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva, the Middle East, and the former Yugoslavia, including a stint uh, as the adjunct director of the ICRC's legal division. He has published extensively on international humanitarian law, international human rights, international criminal law, and the sources of international law. Giving us a country unique perspective, uh, we have two other experts. First, Colonel Ken Watkin is the Deputy Judge Advocate General Operations for the Canadian Forces. He's a graduate of the Royal Military College and Queen's University Law School. His early military service was as an infantry officer with the Royal Canadian Regiment. During his more than 20 years as a military legal officer, Colonel Watkins served in a variety of assignments prior to taking his current position, where, as the Deputy Judge Advocate General, he is responsible for the provision of operational and international legal advice regarding deployments of the Canadian forces. He has published several major articles on the use of force in international humanitarian law in prestigious journals in Canada and here in the, in the United States. And finally, Gary Walsh is the International and Operational Law Advisor in the NORAD U.S. NORTHCOM Judge Advocates Office at Colorado Springs, where he is responsible for, among other things, issues pertaining to the binational, that's U.S.-Canada Planning Group, the NORAD Agreement, Theater Security Cooperation, Special Operations, and Anti-Terrorism and Force Protection. He retired from the United States Army some six years ago following a prestigious 25-year career where he served first, again, as an infantry officer, like Bill, and then as a judge advocate. In the latter capacity, he was a professor on the faculty of the Army's Judge Advocate General School in Charlottesville, Virginia, where he taught international operation law. Gary will be a fitting compliment to Ken and will give us a uniquely American perspective on some of these issues. So without further ado, Bill, you're welcome to the podium. Thank you very much. I, I can't resist pointing out that uh, uh, in The Hague, where I work for the Yugoslav War Crimes Tribunal, of course we have the International Criminal Court uh, newly established, and uh, there has been some suggestion that one of the reasons why its temporary offices are located in such a distant location in The Hague is so that it will be much more difficult for the U.S. Marines to find them when they, they, they arrive. Uh, and with any luck at all, they'll be stuck in traffic anyway. Uh, now, what I intend to do is uh, give a, a bit of an overview on questions of law related to combat, just to provide a bit of a framework for some of the country-specific issues that will come up. Uh, I must also point out that uh, as a former Canadian military lawyer, I'm not really that sure there are major differences at the practical level uh, when the two forces do operate together. Uh, my impression has been that most of the time uh, solutions can be found. Uh, now, as far as the law-related combat is concerned, Essentially, all we're talking about are, or at least all I'll be talking about, are two rules. One, that uh, military forces must direct their operations against legitimate military objectives. And second, that when they do so, uh, they are obligated to make some kind of an assessment of the likelihood and likely extent of collateral civilian casualties, uh, and if these civilian casualties, uh, be they people or things, are disproportionate to the military advantage, uh, then you are obligated 
not to attack or to abort an attack. So what I'm going to be talking about is what's a military objective and what is the principle of proportionality. I, I think as a preliminary to that, one must bear in mind that the law, of course, has a, doesn't come out of nowhere. There are certain underpinnings to it. Uh, one is sort of, I suppose, what one, one might regard as sort of the, the social mores of the time, uh, what is looked on as acceptable in certain circumstances. And uh, there, quite clearly, certain things are acceptable sometimes in a more total war situation and less acceptable other, at other times in a more limited conflict situation. Another thing which must be borne in mind, of course, is uh, technological capability. Uh, it's what can uh, military forces do with the weapons that they've got or the weapons that it's possible for them to obtain. Uh, in connection with the social mores factor, I, I might suggest to you that uh, you can come up with two very, very quick examples. One is that if you look back at the Second World War history, certainly there was much less concern about collateral casualties at that point in time than you would have in a contemporary conflict. Uh, they, there is certainly a much, a much more heightened sensitivity to collateral casualties at least when you were talking about relatively limited conflicts. Uh, secondly, uh, a personal example, uh, from 1978 to 1980, I was involved as part of my country's delegation in negotiation for the Conventional Weapons Convention, which among other things imposed restrictions on the use of landmines. Uh, certainly at that point in time, we were not as concerned as perhaps we should have been about the possibility of uh, civilian casualties as a result of use of anti-personnel landmines. Quite obviously, in the intervening period, that is something which has become uh, much more of concern with the result that you've had the law evolving in that area. Uh, one might also observe, of course, that uh, there is a difference of approach in certain countries towards the application of the law. Uh, have it fall over. Uh, the uh, European countries these days, I would think, uh, would in many respects be looked on as more people from Venus, I suppose, with much more concern about uh, the use of force generally. Uh, whereas uh, the United States apparently is looked on as uh, uh, composed of people from Mars with a somewhat more bellicose disposition. Uh, there was a, a recent book by a fellow named Robert Kagan which made that point at great length. And uh, I must say the European males were extremely upset at any suggestion that they were Venusians. Uh, Now, I've, I've mentioned that te technology or technological capability obviously is something which is of particular importance. If you've got weapons that aren't accurate, uh, then imposing restrictions requiring you to be accurate is not necessarily something that's going to be terribly useful. Uh, for example, during the Second World War, on a number of occasions, the United States Army Air Force apparently bombed Switzerland when it thought it was bombing Germany. Uh, presumably, uh, this was not done intentionally, and presumably uh, it was done because that was what happened with the technology of the day. Uh, since the Second World War, of course, we've had the development of precision guidance technology, uh, and that means that uh, you've got technology which can be can enable you to aim weapons in a much more precise fashion. Uh, it also means that you can 
select more things as military objectives. Uh, sometimes you talk about a wider range of targets, things that you wouldn't have thought of hitting in the past, which may be good, may be bad. Uh, when it comes to determining what constitutes a military objective, uh, as far as people are concerned, military objectives are combatants or they are civilians taking a direct part in hostilities. Where things are concerned, uh, you have a definition in Additional Protocol 1 which essentially talks about objects which make an effective contribution to military action. It's interesting to note that although the United States has on occasion indicated that they looked on the Protocol 1 definition as embodying customary law, uh, they still tend, Americans still tend to adopt a somewhat broader approach to the expression. And for example, if you take a look at the military commission instructions which exist right now, uh, which will be used for the prosecution of the unlawful combatants uh, in the global war on terror, uh, you have a definition of military objective which says, talks about effectively con contributing to the opposing forces war fighting or war sustaining capability. So it would appear that at least as far as definitions go or application of the definition, the United States would appear to have a wider approach to what constitutes a military objective than uh, country, other countries which are party to Additional Protocol 1, or at least other countries which are party to Additional Protocol 1 and adopt a relatively strict definition of the term. Uh, there are quite a number of issues which are relevant in connection with what constitutes a legitimate military objective. One, for example, is if what you were doing is intervening in a good cause, for example, uh, NATO aircraft bombing uh, Yugoslavia uh, because of what was happening in Kosovo, are you then entitled to attack a wider range of military objectives because your cause is good? Or are you obligated to attack a narrower range of military objectives for precisely the same reason? Uh, you have, in fact, uh, scholars advancing both positions. Uh, other issues which are relevant in connection with the definition of a military objective, and indeed there are quite a few, are such things as uh, should civilian morale be regarded as a military objective? Uh, that if one accepts, if one argues that, one has to presumably argue that the approach taken by the additional protocols is somehow broad enough to incorporate morale as a military objective. Uh, one might debate as to whether or not that, in fact, is practicable. Uh, there's another discussion which has been <clears throat> uh, put forward uh, by Amnesty, or by Human Rights Watch, I should say, in a recent report about the uh, bombing campaign in Iraq, in which uh, they were talking at some length about bombing leadership targets. And uh, the, the suggestion by Human Rights Watch was that, at least in the, at least bearing in mind the relative lack of information that was available uh, about the location of leadership figures, uh, that although leadership figures may constitute a legitimate military objective, perhaps one should be very cautious about bombing that kind of a target because normally you don't know where the people actually are. Um, another kind of target which has aroused considerable interest at times is uh, attacks on uh, media, in particular attacking the uh, Serb radio TV station in <clears throat> downtown Belgrade during the campaign related to Kosovo. Uh, there, there was a considerable amount of discussion as to whether or not that was a legitimate military objective. Uh, I must point out that uh, when I was involved in doing our NATO bombing report in the Yugoslav tribunal, uh, 
one of the things that I learned along the way was that apparently uh, Canadians had been selected to bomb another media target uh, and had not done so. And I thought, well, uh, this is an ideal opportunity for me as an ex-Canadian military lawyer to try and find out why Canada decided not to bomb that particular objective. Uh, I must say, Canadian authorities were just as cooperative as the other members of NATO were when we were trying to find out that kind of information. The basic response I got from my Canadian former colleagues was, well, of course we trust you, Bill, but one never knows who you might tell it all about. Uh, so I never got anything more out of Canadians than I got out of uh, US sources or NATO sources in connection with that particular uh, investigation. Uh, just on a closing note in connection with military objectives, I, I, I cannot resist pointing out uh, being that I was at a meeting on one occasion when a distinguished American law professor advanced the argument that uh, one really didn't need to have a definition for what constituted a legitimate military objective because certainly if it was important enough that the U.S. Air Force thought it should bomb the target, they would only be doing it for a good cause, and therefore it must be legitimate by definition. No, 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 no. <laughs> Some, someone, someone else. Uh, if I could move on briefly to talk about uh, the issue of proportionality, which was the other point I suggested I would bring up. Uh, there is, in fact, more or less a general agreement that uh, uh, one is obliged to comply with the principle of proportionality. Uh, there isn't really much discussion about what the wording of any rule related to proportionality is. Uh, where the problem comes in is trying to apply the rule because no one agrees on what constitutes disproportionate damage in relation to a military objective. Indeed, I, I might point out that uh, in one of the cases that I was involved in in the Yugoslav Tribunal, the pr principle of proportionality was an issue of considerable importance to us. Uh, we went around and we talked to uh, senior military or senior military legal people from a variety of countries, uh, mainly NATO countries, uh, we did, in fact, tend to get the Europeans are from Venus approach when we talked to European generals. It was uh, really quite disconcerting, actually. Uh, uh, some members, uh, some very senior generals from NATO countries, European NATO countries, uh, uh, seemed to feel that virtually any civilian casualties were too many civilian casualties. Uh, one might be inclined to assume that that was because they had not recently been engaged in armed conflict. Um, on the other hand, I think when it came to trying to come up with a reasonable standard, uh, one would find, quite frankly, that Canadians and Americans and British tended to adopt a reasonably similar approach. There are, although there might be an unspecified or sort of generic agreement, however, on uh, what constitutes proportionality, uh, there are still specific questions which different countries might be inclined to adopt different approaches to. Uh, for example, uh, are civilians who are located inside a military objective or who are voluntarily adjacent to a military objective uh, people who should be included in the proportionality equation. This is an issue which came up in connection with the bombing over Yugoslavia, where you had occasions where uh, people in Belgrade, for example, would put on their special NATO target t-shirts and go out to the nearest bridge and uh, stand there waving up at the NATO aircraft, which of course they couldn't see, but uh, just uh, making themselves uh, volunteer hostages uh, to discourage NATO from bombing the bridges. Uh, one can, of course, make an argument, I suppose, that these people have disentitled themselves to 
uh, being considered civilians for purposes of the proportionality equation. Uh, that being said, I, I think I, I at least would suggest the better view is that they are not disentitled. I think that whenever you've got civilians present, uh, no matter how they got there, you still have to include them on the civilian side of the proportionality equation. Another issue which was uh, uh, some dis discussed at some length uh, following the first Gulf conflict uh, was long-term effects. Uh, should one or should not one not take account of the fact that uh, uh, when you knock out uh, the electricity supply, for example, that over a lengthy period of time, if that electricity supply remains uh, out of operation, you end up uh, accumulating quite a large number of civilian casualties that you wouldn't have in the, the initial attack. Uh, that's an unresolved issue. Uh, but uh, one which is still certainly worthy of discussion and perhaps adoption of a national position. I, if I might close I, on the proportionality issue, when we were involved in the Galich case, the one involving the Corps Commander of Sarajevo, I, one of the incidents that we had there was a, the shelling of a, a soccer game at a place called Gobrinia. I, we learned as our case evolved that in fact there were more military casualties caused in the shelling of the Debrinia soccer game than there were civilian casualties. And the question was, was that or was that not going to be disproportionate? Uh, certainly at first glance one would assume it would not be disproportionate because a life is a life is a life. Uh, having said that, I must say our tribunal sort of finessed the issue rather neatly by saying what counted for purposes of, the, of that particular count in the indictment was not uh, whether or not the end result was that disproportionate civilian casualties were caused, but what the intent was on the part of those who were shelling the soccer game in the first place. And the assumption or the conclusion of the court was that the intent was to, at the very least, recklessly expose the civilian population uh, to uh, being attacked. And as a result, they found the accused guilty uh, of attacking the civilian population, even though one might question whether or not, in that particular instance, the, casual, the end result casualties were disproportionate. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you very much to have invited someone from far away Switzerland uh, but who has been until recently in Canada to this very interesting conference. Um, I should speak about, uh, you have a little outline of what I should uh, speak about, about the possible differences in approach uh, towards humanitarian law between uh, the US and Canada. And uh, this is a difficult subject, you can already put your cross on, uh, knows the subject, no, he doesn't know the subject, I try to. Uh, the position of the US is well known, perhaps also because the US is more involved in practicing humanitarian law in armed conflict, while when one wants to know from uh, a Canadian military uh, where, whether they agree with that, uh, you will not get an official answer. My feeling is that uh, basically uh, the two countries have very similar approaches uh, because both uh, armed, the armed forces of both countries are committed to the respect of humanitarian law in armed conflicts and believe that something like the laws of war can work. Um, beyond that, uh, I will make a lot of uh, hypotheses. There may be differences in perceiving the role of lawyers in US forces and in Canadian forces. Um, it's already that uh, 
the United States, Jack is part of the chain of command, and in the Marines, if I understand correctly, they even uh, alternate with line officers, while in Canada it's more separate. Uh, and by the way, the uh, Judge Advocate General is, uh, together with the Chief of Staff, uh, the only two people who are nominated by the Governor General in Council. Uh, perhaps related to that, but to, to a whole philosophy, I have the feeling that Canadian military lawyers perceive their uh, role more like that of an expert telling the commander this is the legal framework of what you uh, will do, while perhaps more frequently U.S. military lawyers perceive themselves are somehow the attorney of their commander, giving the good legal arguments for the decision the commander wants uh, to take. But I have no proof for all that. Um, this may also be related to the training in law schools. I mean, uh, training of arguing a case, which is very good when in, in internal law when there is a judge, while in international law it gives the impression that law is only something about arguments, while law, um, and even international law, is also something about right and wrong solutions. Then there are the classical problems of interoperability due to dif uh, differing uh, treaty obligations. Uh, we have heard the US, and everyone knows the US is a party to very few treaties, and Canada is a party to nearly all treaties. And, well, this is an old problem in NATO. Uh, but this problem has always existed. Uh, it can be solved, and one has to, I think, in practice, as, we, uh, as was already mentioned, Anyway, the U.S. opposition to some of these treaties is more ideological than practical, um, and the few rules they are really opposed to are rather ideological, like national liberation wars. Uh, even the issue uh, Scott Sullivan mentioned about uh, the requirements uh, to for combatant status, uh, where indeed uh, Protocol One asks less than the Geneva Conventions ask, interestingly enough, in the whole Guantanamo discussion, this was never an issue, uh, but the whole discussion can be purely based on the third Geneva Convention. So I think in most cases, the practical issues which arise in actual armed conflict are not so much influenced by these differing uh, treaty obligations, because in the U.S. Uh, military manuals, most of the rules of Protocol 1 have been uh, integrated. Then there may be a differing understanding of what is customary uh, international humanitarian law and how it develops. Uh, I have the feeling that the U.S. like customary law. Um, and they have, uh, obviously, customary law is based on practice, and they say, well, and who practices most? We do. And so what we do is practice, and therefore um, we act uh, in conformity with uh, customary law. While, obviously, the Canadian lawyers have uh, perhaps a more multilateral understanding of what is practice, including, which is more a theoretical issue, that practice is not only what uh, belligerents do, but also what non-belligerents say in international conferences and so on. Um, then perhaps more serious are the problems raised by the fact that Canada has accepted uh, additional implementation mechanisms. Um, while, as you know, the US is very reticent to any third party uh, supervision, because they suspect, and sometimes I can understand them, that anyway this third party will be against them. Um, but for the International Criminal Court statute, obviously the fact that the US is not a party and the, uh, Canada is a party, this is not so much the problem. Then, and we will discuss about that uh, tomorrow, that the US wants to avoid that Canada respects its own obligations under the ICC statute regarding US citizens. And uh, that it also wants to avoid Canada to respect its obligations in um, during joint operations. 
My main point uh, is about uh, a recent development in humanitarian law because uh, I have the feeling that uh, what Bill Fenrick said uh, on a very similar approach to humanitarian law may have changed uh, through a quite revolutionary development uh, the U.S. understanding of humanitarian law applicable to the so-called war against terrorism. And there the first question is, is that an armed conflict? Uh, I liked very much this morning the presentation comparing Al-Qaeda with Mafia. Well, uh, coming partly from Italy, I think there has never been the idea in Italy that the fight against Mafia is an armed conflict. Um, so, it, what, where the September 11 uh, attack were they part of an armed conflict or did they start an armed conflict? There I think you can have uh, both positions, but then to say that everything around it is also an armed conflict is quite astonishing under traditional understanding of armed conflicts. By the way, what is interesting in the Madrid attacks is when, as long as the Spanish government uh, claimed that it was ETA, I think no one would have suggested that now there is an armed conflict in Spain. But this is simply mass crime. Um, uh, if I understand correctly, even after we uh, learned that it was uh, connected to Al-Qaeda, the Spanish government does not consider that this is part of an armed conflict. If it is an armed conflict, the question is obviously, do we have one or do we have several armed conflicts? And there it's quite astonishing the U.S. theory that this is one worldwide armed conflict against terrorism and those who are with the terrorists, especially taking into account that Al-Qaeda is a name for something, but it, while it would be much easier, especially for minds like me and the military who like hierarchies, uh, to fight against it if it was a hierarchical organization, it is not. So is it with one armed conflict or several armed conflicts? I sometimes think uh, during the Cold War, some t somehow it was also uh, conflict against communism. It was the Cold War, but no one claimed that simply because some of these conflicts were international. Uh, the conflict, uh, the Korea War and the Vietnam War largely, that the civil war in Greece, which was also about communism against uh, the free world, would have been an international armed conflict or part of the same conflict, or that uh, political violence in Italy or Germany against communist movements uh, would also be part of that armed conflict. Now, even if it is an armed, in a one single armed conflict, uh, the, it is astonishing that the U.S. claimed that it is an international armed conflict. Under the definition of Article 2 of the Geneva Conventions, it is clearly not, because Article 2 defines an international armed conflict as a conflict between high contacting parties, and Al-Qaeda is not a high contacting party while Afghanistan and Iraq are, but these are two separate armed conflicts. And now the US simply say, yes, but the customary law definition is different. Uh, this is again about customary law, because if customary law has something to do with past practice, in past practice, states always refuse to apply humanitarian law to confrontation with uh, terrorists. Uh, movement, and if ever it was a non-international armed conflict, they would ne never have applied the laws of international armed conflict. And if it is such a conflict, obviously the question arises, when did it begin and when does it end, which is important for humanitarian law, when it does it end, because that's the moment when the prisoners of war or the combatants have to be repatriated. Now. Uh, somehow terrorism is very similar to evil, and I learned in my Catholic uh, catechism that uh, the war against evil will end only the day of judgment. Does that mean that these guys in Guantanamo will stay there until doomsday? Mm. Um, then, somehow, 
being someone who likes humanitarian law, I should be very happy about the US position because they want to apply the largest part of humanitarian law, which is the law of international armed conflicts to all that. The problem is that their enemies in this uh, war are not uh, treated under humanitarian law. Uh, they are labeled as unlawful combatants. And the first uh, consequence of that is that they may be targeted like lawful combatants at any time until they surrender. This means including while they uh, attend the birthday party of their grandmother or they uh, board a plane. Uh, this is the official U.S. position that uh, members of terrorist movements, including someone like Jose Padilla, a U.S. citizen in Chicago, may be targeted. Um, then, okay, they are treated like combatants, but they don't get the benefits of combatants. Um, they have no combatant and prisoner of war status, and this is obviously correct for Al-Qaeda. Uh, because they do not fulfill the requirement of Article 4A2 of the Third Convention, while for the Taliban it's much more astonishing, but the U.S. do not make distinctions. I mean, uh, it's one war and one enemy, and um, they are unlawful combatants. Uh, now, if they are not combatants, what is astonishing is that they are not either civilians, and under humanitarian law there are only two statuses. Either one is a civilian or a combatant in international armed conflict. Uh, this is clear under the wording of the Fort Geneva Convention defining the protected civilians as everyone who is not protected by Convention 3 if they comply with the nationality criteria, obviously. Um, by the trouble preparatoire of the Convention, by the whole logic of the Convention, it is confirmed in the ICSC commentary to the Conventions and it has been applied in the past uh, this way. Now, if, assuming that it is right that there are neither combatants nor civilians, these uh, enemies, what is uh, most astonishing is, okay, they are not protected by the statuses of humanitarian law, but apparently they are not either covered by human rights law nor by domestic law, uh, because uh, the argument goes, humanitarian law is a kind of lex specialis compared to human rights law, and therefore those unlawful combatants, while they don't benefit from protection of humanitarian law, nevertheless they are not, they are deprived of the protection of human rights law because they fall under humanitarian law, and while under the domestic law any detention must be based on the law, and most of the time decided by a court, here it is not necessary because these people are like combatants, and indeed, genuine combatants, enemy prisoners of war, do not benefit from judicial guarantees before they may be interned. They may be interned due to the sole fact that they are members of the enemy armed forces, but my point would be it is much easier to determine whether someone belongs to the German Wehrmacht during the Second World War than uh, whether someone belongs to the terrorists, the enemy of the US and the world in the war against terror. And then fortunately the US doesn't claim that these people may be tortured, but uh, you know that there is a so-called law professor at the Harvard University who uh, favors that. And uh, fortunately, this, I have some hope for the U.S. Supreme Court deciding soon that uh, even those people in Guantanamo may come before a U.S. court, or even those, there are two, I think, Hamdi and Padilla detained in U.S. citizens detained on U.S. territory who are deprived of uh, any habeas corpus. In Canada, I think this issue could not arise because this, under uh, the Canadian Charter it uh, clearly uh, covers also behavior of Canadian officials abroad. Okay, these are my uh, suppos suppositions. What could be the differences in approach? Uh, obviously, these differences are also based on the on the power disparity, I mean, it's certainly easier for Canada 
to comply with the traditional rules of humanitarian law than for the US uh, active worldwide in uh, as a belligerent. But I'm convinced that this war could be won uh, in an easier way and in a more efficient way if the laws applicable to the war were applied or if we didn't call it war. But then let's apply domestic law and human rights law. Thank you very much. Well, I must say I hadn't expected the presentations this afternoon, this afternoon to be a comparison between Canadian and military legal officers. Uh, I must admit that my initial military uh, training on law of armed conflict, or I, uh, international humanitarian law, as I'll call it this afternoon, was in fact at the U.S. Army JAG School. We, uh, and in fact the U.S. military, have been world leaders in terms of getting that uh, message out on uh, international humanitarian law. That being said, we have subsequently developed our own training on the law of armed conflict, to our own national perspective on the, on the subject. And I must admit, though, I've been on a play of words this morning, I do find that we are different, but very familiar at the end of the day. And I think that would be the focus of the presentation that I have. When first presented with the idea of talking about this subject, potential differences, I was convinced, and still, I must admit, am convinced, that the differences on the theoretical and the academic plane are ultimately much greater than on the practical application plane. It's the nature of the work we do. Uh, international humanitarian law is a very practical law, and you have to find practical solutions to practical problems that still deal with humanity while conducting military operations. And it should, should come as no surprise for the two countries that are so committed to the rule of law that there should be a commitment to compliance with international humanitarian law. Certainly, our two, our two nations have demonstrated a long-standing ability to work together. Even if you think post-Cold War, and you look at uh, land operations in the Balkans, Haiti, Somalia, uh, and Afghanistan, air operations in the 1991 Gulf conflict in Kosovo, and maritime interdiction operations off Haiti and the Adriatic and the Gulf, you see a long, a long history and a wide variety of operations where our military forces and others have conducted coalition or multilateral operations. The Canadians pride themselves on their ability and commitment to multilateralism, and this includes the multilateral use of military forces. And this covers the range of conflict from acting in self-defense, which really means involvement in an armed conflict, and Canadian forces are war fighters as well as peacekeepers, to the range of activities right down to peacekeeping and nation building. We also have our mutual defense agreement with the United States in NORAD. Right now in, in ISAF, the International Security Assistance Force, in Kabul and Afghanistan, more than 30 different nations are under the command of a Canadian general in a NATO uh, command structure. Certainly when operations are mounted, there are no decisions that have to be made with respect to the framework for the application of law. One of those comes out in the context of rules of engagement, and there are some operations where everyone arrives with their own rules of engagement generated nationally, and there are other operations where there are coalition rules of engagement. But even in that context, it's a clear understanding that not all nations will necessarily sign up the rules of engagement in the same way. There will be national caveats and national interpretations. It is quite simply a fact of modern military operations. But Canada is not unique in this. And in fact, the United States, I would suggest, is equally committed to a multilateral coalition approach to the conduct of operations for a variety of reasons, which results in the need to cooperate in understanding what the respective countries commitment is to international humanitarian law. We do have differences, as Scott noted, and two that stand out are the Anti-Personnel Mines Convention and Additional Protocol 1. The question is, to what degree do these differences make an impact on the ground in the practical application of the law? I categorize four possible ranges of differences. One I'll call substantive, the example being the, the Anti-Personnel Mines Convention, 
foundational, and in this context I will talk a bit about respective national interpretations of terrorism and their impact on international humanitarian law. Subtle are respective potential differences with respect to military objects. And finally, uncertain law. In this context, I want to address it in the idea of targeting those who take a direct part in hostilities. Turning first to substantive differences. It's somewhat trite to say Canada and the US have different views nationally on the Anti-Personnel Mines Convention. We've signed, the US hasn't, and recently announced it does not intend to. So the question is, what does that mean in terms of the actual application? Certainly with our commitment in Canada, there, there is a prohibition on the use, development, production, stockpiling, retention, or transfer of anti-personnel mines, as well as assisting, encouraging, or inducing such activities. So one would think we simply can't operate with the U.S. forces. And clearly that is not the case either. We have, provide, we have developed and provided clear direction to our personnel as to what the limits and constructs are with respect to their conducting operations with any nation, and it's not just the U.S., which has not signed up to the Anti-Personnel Mines Convention. And in that, in, if you want to see that list, you can find it on the, uh, on the web. It's on the uh, Judge Edward General's website in our Law of Armed Conflict Manual. And in Chapter 5, it sets out what the direction is to Canadian Forces personnel. We do continue to operate. And there are a number of reasons why I think, sorry, the other thing I should mention is, at the time of signing, Canada did enter an understanding. And I think it's important to, to ensure you read the understanding as well as the text of the convention. The mere participation by the Canadian forces or individual Canadians in operations, exercises, or other military activity conducted in combination with other armed forces of states not party to the convention, which engage in activity prohibited under the convention, would not consider to be basically a breach of the convention. Now, I'm too, I, I wasn't involved in that at the time, but it's clear to me that the background to that was to allow the continued multilateral operation of the states who are not parties to the convention. It strikes me there's three possible ways in which this hasn't become a problem. First of all, with respect to uh, military operations, most states don't use any personnel lines. Uh, secondly, we are not, and even the ones who have not signed the convention don't use them in most operations. Secondly, we are not the only country that the U.S. has to deal with in any coalition that signed up to the convention. And I call this the great level, leveler of multilateral coalition operations. And finally, Canadian forces, officers on exchange or otherwise, or in command positions, understand their limits and will, will seek national direction if this issue arises. The second issue is one that I call foundational. And here I've chosen the, uh, the terrorism uh, word. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about the context of Additional Protocol 1, but I'm not trying to suggest for a second that Additional Protocol 1 applies as a matter of law to the war or campaign on terrorism. It is, however, the most modern consensus we have in writing, black letter law, of what many of, many of the principles are with respect to international you know, humanitarian law. To that extent, I, I would like to, to uh, raise a concern, though, and one that requires much more debate, is the use of the term terrorism itself and what that means. We, it has a wide variety of meanings, and for example, there are many people who hear the word terrorism and say it is only amenable to a law enforcement response. And certainly that's the context in which I heard Ambassador McNamara making the analogy to the Mafia. And certainly, there is a law enforcement aspect with respect to terrorism. But when terrorists organize themselves with the ability to inflict damage that rivals that of nation states, and in, in fact inflict mass murder of the scale of 9-11, then clearly they also organize themselves along military lines. And you get this issue of it's not just armed conflict, it's also law enforcement. And in fact, that's been the reaction of the world community. That being said, one of the issues with respect to signing on to AP1 appears to have been an issue about its scope, as was mentioned earlier, expanding it to what I would call national liberation movements. 
And, the, and one, of the, one of the challenges of looking in this area is there isn't a lot written on it. What's largely written is around the late 1980 time frame at the time that President Reagan sent a letter to the Senate indicating why they were not going to, uh, to seek the advice and consent for ratification. But in the words of President Reagan, the U.S. must not and need not give recognition and protection to terrorist groups. There was a interpretation, as I understand it, that this expansion of international humanitarian law was giving legitimacy to terrorist organizations. Clearly, Canada is one of the 161 countries who have signed and ratified additional protocol one, don't see it in quite that perspective. And this, of course, I see as a foundational issue with respect to the idea of terrorism. I would suggest that it might indicate a view of terrorism that's more than just acts against civilians or suicide bombers, the way in which acts are carried out, but also addresses the issue of non-state actors being associated as terrorist groups. And this, it can be found, I think, in some of the uh, definitions. For instance, the National Strategy for Combating Terrorism defines the U.S. National Strategy defines it as premeditated, politically motivated violence perpetrated against non-combatant targets by subnational groups or clandestine agents. The Canadian definition of terrorism, if one wanted to look for one, a legal definition, I would suggest is a case called Suresh versus Canada, a 2002 case, that relied on the International Convention for the Suppression of the Financing of Terrorism definition, which included an act intended to cause death or serious bodily injury to a civilian or to any person not taking an active part in hostilities in a situation of armed conflict when the purpose of such an act by its nature or context is to intimidate the population and so on, basically for a political purpose. And there, there's no reference to the state aspect. It's, it's just a person. And so there's one of the fund foundational challenges, I would suggest, that has to be worked through in terms of understanding what terrorism might be. But it is only one of a myriad of problems with the use of the term terrorism in terms of identifying the foe which we all face. The, uh, this has an issue, though, with respect to the idea of combatancy. And the idea that the U.S. might be wedded to a notion which is state-centric state is not unique. There's a history of this throughout international humanitarian law and its codification in terms of the the uh, definition of who a combatant might, might be. And certainly the criteria for combatancy are state-like cri criteria for the most part. On the other side has been a, a group of nations, interestingly called sort of the patriotic group, that has looked at arming the people as an example of who might get combatancy. And of course, if you look at international humanitarian law, you see sort of bookends on this notion of combatancy. On one end, you have regular armed forces and militia meeting certain criteria. Now, the other end, you have a levy on mass. The problem is no one could agree on the middle at the time of defining who a combatant might be. The third group that, uh, I should suggest that as well, the fact that we might have different foundational approaches does not mean that there's necessarily a problem in our interoperability. Canada, as well as the US, not only acted with the North Atlantic Council under Article 5 in terms of acting in self-defense, it also on its own indicated it was acting in self-defense, both collective and individual, against Osama bin Laden, the Al-Qaeda, and their Taliban supporters. That was a national decision to do that. And that's what brings in the armed conflict. The third one is a more subtle one, which is military object. And I don't plan to get into that too much because Bill has talked about many of the issues. But it is, of course, much more nuanced and, and contextual than that. As I understand the U.S. position, it itself is, while often seen as a more liberal context, may not be uniform. And the U.S. Army adopts the, the additional protocol one wording, much like Canada has, whereas the Navy Commander's Handbook uses the broader wording that's worked its way into the U.S. Uh, Commission number two uh, outline. The real question is, at the end of the day, is what does that mean? Because Canada itself has put in an understanding with respect to uh, Article 52 and 57, which indicates the military advantage anticipated from an attack is intended to refer to the advantage anticipated from the attack considered as a whole and not from isolated parts of the attack. Now, I was too young at the time. Bill Fenwick certainly would be able to tell us more on the rationale with respect to that. 
But in that context, it indicates a concern over a broader understanding of what military objective might be. If I turn to the ICRC commentaries, they make reference to the 1956 draft rules that they worked on, which indicated as potential objectives, railway lines, roads, broadcasting, and television stations of fundamental military importance, supply, fuel, and chemical industries. Much depends on the purpose for which those facilities are used, which brings to this context of dual use and the controversy over the radio stations, electrical generating stations, and those types of issues. At the end of the day, I am certain that the practical solutions to these very general concepts of targeting will depend upon the facts that you are presented with and, and the objectivity with which you apply to them. And ultimately, one of the challenges for national humanitarian law is enhancing the, the accountability process for that decision-making uh, process. Finally, I turn to uncertain law, and I want to touch on this because it is certainly the law of much controversy that has largely been generated by the issue of combating terrorism. And certainly in additional protocol one, we have this issue of, well, it goes to the heart of the principle of distinction. And when you think of distinction, the, one of the fundamental tenets of IHL, people think of combatants and civilians. But it is far more nuanced, and really it is, against those who participate in hostilities and those who do not. The notion of combatancy itself is an unsettled notion at law. It's not as clear as many people think. And conversely, there are a large number of civilians who take part in hostilities. This has, however, raised allegations of extrajudicial killing and assassination on the one hand, and counterclaims that, no, we're simply targeting not only the people with weapons in their hands, but the planners and commanders that send them on their missions. And clearly that is the challenge. The analysis of this issue uncovers two, what I would suggest, are very unsettling points. First, the black letter law is not terribly consistent in its use of terms. And when you go to I, the IHL treaties, you can find a wide variety of terms, including acts harmful to the enemy as the basis for which you might lose your status. And secondly, even if you use the AP1 Article 51 definition, taking a direct part in hostilities, it's very hard to find academic writing that provides any guidance to the military, American, or US, or other nations, in terms of what that definition is. And indeed, last June, there was a meeting in The Hague, sponsored by the ICRC, to begin a process to try to define this. And of course, these definitions are very much about life and death. There is much work to be done. Bill has mentioned the uh, Human Rights Watch off-target report, and I would only s suggest this along uh, this line. He mentioned one part of the report. In that report, which was looking at targeting in Iraq by a uh, coalition, but largely uh, U.S. forces, it applied the Article 52 test for military objects to the question of targeting individuals. And so that, to me, gives a degree of the uncertainty there is right now with respect to the law in that context. Certainly there are, this is one area of international humanitarian law where there's considerable room for disagreement and debate, but for the practitioners on the ground who have to make decisions under very short time periods, life and death decisions where I can tell you there always isn't enough intelligence. There's going to, there's going to be room for error, but there's also, I would suggest, also going to be a great deal of similarity in terms of approach. In summary, there are a number of ways in which differences in the Canadian and American, in the US application of international humanitarian law can arise. I've indicated substantive, potential, subtle, and even uncertain differences. In addition, it's inevitable our two nations, for a variety of reasons, will adopt different interpretations of both conventional and customary international law. The Canadian forces applies its own national laws and its interpretations of the treaties, conventions, and customary international law. So does the US, and neither of our two nations should find this shocking. So does the UK, Italy, Argentina, Pakistan, India, and the wide variety of other nations with which we operate. However, none of this should be an impediment to the efficient and effective operation of our military forces in coalition or multilateral efforts. In the past 50 years, there has been a concentrated effort 
to separate the application of international humanitarian law during conflict from the law applicable to the decision to engage in conflict, the use ad bellum question. IHL has always been a very practical body of law with the goal of providing universal coverage to the practical problems of all nations confronted during armed conflict. A wide variety of nations regularly cooperate in multilateral and bilateral military missions, and given the dangers in this world, we will continue to have we will have to continue to do so. Thank you very much. Bill and Marco and Ken have very succinctly framed the issues and posed some of the, uh, the, the questions about what direction we're going to go, particularly in the war, uh, the global war on terrorism. They've done it so well, in fact, that they didn't leave me a whole lot uh, left to talk about. So uh, we will get through this fairly quickly. I do, however, want to uh, address a couple of points that were raised in, in their presentations. And also, in order to talk about the, the differing approach that U.S. military attorneys take to combat operations and Canadian attorneys take, uh, in order to talk about that in a little greater detail, there's, I want to paint a picture of what the, the, the history was, why we are at the point we are now within the U.S. military and our legal support to, uh, to combat operations. The JAG Corps was essentially started way back in 1775 with the Continental Army. And, and attorneys have been active in every military operation in the United States since then, but primarily in the role of advising commanders on military justice types of, types of issues. Uh, in fact, in World War II, the, uh, about the only involvement that an attorney had in any combat operation that I was able to discover through research was a, uh, an army captain by the name of Epstein, who was sent into a, a village in France occupied by the German army. And uh, the commander figured that if anybody could negotiate with the Germans and convince them that they should surrender, it would be this attorney. And in fact, he received a silver star for his, his heroic actions. But the real involvement of attorneys in, in World War II, and then again in Vietnam, outside the scope of the traditional military justice issues, uh, came in the, the tribunals that were set up after uh, World War II and in the war crimes investigations in, uh, in Vietnam, the Peers Commission that uh, investigated the My Lai incident. It wasn't until 1983 when we had a watershed event within the U.S. military. President Reagan sent a task force to Grenada to rescue medical students at the St. George's School of Medicine and Surfing. These were U.S. citizens that uh, were attending an offshore medical school and got caught up in a coup that uh, was underway in Grenada. In addition, Sir Paul Schoon, the Governor General, had requested military assistance so the, uh, from the United States. So um, the 82nd Airborne Division and, uh, and some Ranger units and Marines and other folks were sent down to Grenada. And we, we kind of knew what we were doing for the first two or three days. It was traditional law of war issues. You know, uh, sir, you can't shoot the prisoners. Yeah, I got that. That's fine. And then the shooting stopped. And then the real legal, legal issues arose. What to do with the Soviet diplomats, the, uh, the North Korean diplomats that were on the island. And we're trying to get off. We, we happen to just disregard all the, uh, uh, the conventions on diplomatic and consular relations. And we searched their vehicles, we searched their persons uh, before we put them on our aircraft. Uh, we, had, we had protests as a result of that. There were a number of mistakes that we made in Grenada that really served as a, a wake-up call to the, uh, to the Army JAG Corps and then the rest of the branches as well. So we got very serious at that point about studying the law of military operations both in, in international armed conflicts low intensity conflicts, peacekeeping, peace enforcement operations. That was the genesis of operational law as we know it today. The, the doctrine is, is becoming more and more established, uh, particularly after we go through operations like uh, the first Gulf War and this, uh, this current uh, conflict over in Iraq and Afghanistan. We are now 
very well organized in terms of a branch in providing legal advice to commanders. Uh, we go so far as to make sure that every every officer coming in to the, uh, the Army Jack Corps and the other services as well gets extensive uh, instruction, not just on the law of armed conflict, but on all these other issues that arise when you when you get involved in, uh, in something like uh, enduring freedom or Iraqi freedom. The, the Canadian forces had a watershed event as well in Somalia in 1993. There was uh, an incident involving a, a detainee and, uh, and the subsequent death of that detainee. Um, the, the Canadian forces uh, implemented these operational law and law of armed conflict uh, short courses and, uh, and in, in addition, the Canadian forces also have a, a much higher, proportionally higher uh, number of attorneys who have received advanced degrees in international law. Now that's one of the, the differences, I guess, between uh, the Canadian forces and U.S. forces. We have bordering on 4,000 uh, active duty judge advocates amongst all the different services in the United States. The Canadian forces have about 100 to 115, so they have to cover a, uh, a larger field with fewer people, but almost 40%, almost 50% really, of their, uh, their officers have advanced degrees in law, criminal law or international law. So they are much better prepared to uh, to handle the, the real in-depth questions on, uh, on international humanitarian law. One of the other uh, uh, comparisons of, of our forces and the Canadian force judge advocates is that uh, where they are assigned. Uh, Marco brought up the uh, the assignment policy within the Canadian forces. A Canadian judge advocate such as uh, Jean Caron, who was assigned to NORAD in Colorado Springs, is, is not actually assigned to a command. He is not under the responsibility or supervision of a command. A Canadian Forces Judge Advocate works for the Canadian Forces uh, legal branch. It, it is a stovepipe organization. And the purpose for that, as I understand it, is to ensure independence in the, in the kind of advice that's given to a commander. Now the U.S. forces take a, a slightly different approach where we are actually assigned to an organization, we're assigned to a command. Our client is the Navy, the Army, the Marine Corps, but we live and, and, and our evaluation reports, as an example, are sometimes written by commanders. Now that does result in the, the, uh, the attorney really getting a great feel for the client, but there's the, the danger of that, of that attorney kind of uh, going off onto the dark side, being co-opted, losing his or her objectivity. So that's, uh, those are some of, kind of some comparisons uh, and contrasts on the way that attorneys approach advising commanders in the Canadian forces and the U.S. forces. Now with regard to interoperability issues, several of them have been raised already. One, one issue that uh, we haven't discussed is the use of deadly force to protect property. In U.S. Um, operations plans, we have rules of engagement. It's an annex to the plan. The rules of engagement are, are established at the Joint uh, Chiefs of Staff level, at the Joint Staff level in the Pentagon. But it's kind of a, a, a menu of, uh, of rules that, uh, that a commander who actually is tasked with performing an operation can, can uh, select from or ask modification of. The attorney is involved uh, in, in the U.S. forces is involved in that drafting process. So inevitably the, the question comes up, how, when can we use deadly force? In, uh, in rules of engagement, in uh, conflict operations outside the United States, is relatively clear cut. When we get into peacekeeping uh, and peace enforcement operations though, or in domestic support, uh, support to U.S. Uh, agencies within the United States, Rules for use of force, which are distinguished from ROE, are much more complex. So this, this issue of deadly force to protect property sometimes can be problematic. As an example, in uh, Somalia in 1993, when uh, Task Force Ranger was sent to apprehend General ID and those responsible for the, the massacre of the Pakistani peacekeepers, 
Um, one of, of the, the concerns that the force had was the theft of night vision goggles. This was essentially a law enforcement operation and, uh, and arrest and apprehend for trial operation. Um, we had to use the, uh, the advantages that we have with night vision technology and, and, and speed and, and using helicopters and all that. The loss of night vision goggles was, was more threatening to the operation than a loss of an M16. So in our operation, we justified the use uh, of deadly force to protect night vision goggles. That would be a, an issue in a combined operation with Canadian forces, as I understand it. So there is there is one issue there that, uh, again, is not major. We can work around that. And as a practical matter, it, it doesn't happen all that. We never had to use deadly force to protect property. It was it was all in defense of, uh, of, of individuals. One other uh, interoperability issue is uh, the, the employment of riot control agents. The 1993 uh, Chemical Weapons Convention essentially uh, prohibits the, the use of any chemical or toxic uh, incapacitating agents. Uh, the United States and the uh, United States assigned uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention as, as uh, 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 Canada, but we have a, an executive order, 11850, that was signed by President Ford that, uh, that says that riot control agents can be employed in very uh, restricted situations, not as a method of warfare. So the interpretation of the U.S. government is that uh, the use of pepper spray or, or tear gas, as an example, to control crowds, uh, unruly crowds, rioting prisoners of war, or to use on rescue operations, or perhaps even to use when uh, when the enemy is, is infiltrated into a group of civilians and attacking from that group of civilians in order to protect the lives of the non-combatants, then, uh, then we, we understand that uh, and we reserve the right to use right control agency in, uh, in those very limited circumstances. The, the convention only allows the use of right control agents in rear areas to control rioting crowds. So there could possibly be an interoperability issue there. But again, it doesn't happen. The last time we used riot control agents was um, really it was in Vietnam. And uh, we, we, did not, we did not use them in Somalia, although we considered the use in Somalia. Uh, we found out that it just there were other methods of trying to protect non-combatants and control crowds that were much more effective than, than riot control agents. Landmines have already been discussed. Um, as uh, Scott mentioned, the policy that President Bush announced in December uh, seems to take care of some of the issues with regard to interoperability. We will ensure that uh, first the United States is going to um, eliminate the use of all persistent landmines, except for those that are used in the defense of South Korea. Uh, within uh, within about two years. And we're developing the technology to ensure that non-persistent anti-personnel and anti-vehicle anti-tank mines um, will be much more uh, reliable in terms of self-destruction so that those, those mines will not pose a risk, even if they do happen to um, be in an area where there's their non-combatant uh, occupation, you know, would reduce the risk of any unintentional uh, damage, injury, or killing of, of civilians. Uh, we, we do use anti-personnel mines. Uh, Claymore mines is an example set up around a, a, a defensive position. And uh, there, was, there were combined operations in Afghanistan between Canadian forces and U.S. forces where U.S. forces in place anti-personnel mines uh, for protection of that position. And, and as, um, as was explained, the Canadian forces uh, were able to operate within that area without violating the terms of the, uh, the anti-personnel uh, mine ban. Let me just address the, uh, lastly, the, the whole issue on uh, global war on terrorism. As Marco said, the United States uh, takes the approach that customary international law is is an, it is a living, uh, evolving concept. It's called uh, state practice 
and, uh, and just like the practice of law, you just keep doing it until you get it right. We now are faced with a threat, a, a threat that we had not encountered prior to 9-11 at such a level of, uh, of organization and, and uh, violence. We, we had attacks against U.S. interests starting really in 1979 in Tehran. That may have been the first, that may have been the opening shot in the war on terrorism. But on 9-11, we went way beyond uh, the bombing of a, a ship in, in Yemen or the, uh, the attack on Kobar Towers in, in Saudi Arabia. We saw a level of organized activity of such substantial gravity that, that it really demanded a response by military force. So while we, we look at this as an armed conflict, we don't want to exclude the, uh, the options of law enforcement actions. What I'm, I'm saying is that it's not an either or situation that we're in, it's a both and. The, the level of threat demands the, uh, dictates the type of response that, uh, that comes from the, the, the country that it's attacked. And in this case, um, we are in an armed conflict. Uh, we do have combatants that, uh, that we are uh, capturing in, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the, the understanding and the interpretation of, uh, of the United States with regard to the Geneva Conventions is that these are unlawful combatants because they are, they are not complying with the law of armed conflict. And, uh, and as a result, uh, we're able to detain them and um, until the end of the conflict. Um, the, the whole issue is going to be uh, addressed next week, April 20th. The Supreme Court is going to hear, uh, uh, opening, or hear oral arguments on Hamdi and, uh, and Padilla and four other detainees down in Guantanamo Bay. So we'll, uh, we'll probably hear by July whether, uh, whether the, United, the United States government's position on this is, uh, is meritorious or not. The, the real uh, exciting part of this is the, are the questions and, and answers and so let me sit down and uh, open the floor for questions. Any questions or comments? And then wait, uh, if you wait for a microphone. Then. Thank you very much. Lynn Hope with uh, Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, this is a question I think for Gary Walsh, but uh, others may want to contribute as well. Um, and in, uh, it is this, uh, recent news events have brought to light the use of contract civilian forces in Iraq to provide security for uh, various kinds of, of operations that are going there, rebuilding operations and so on. And my question is, uh, what kind of rules of engagement, uh, if any, uh, apply or ought to apply to these forces, uh, and also what kind of interoperability issues arise uh, since you have armed individuals in an area where uh, combat operations take place who are not subject to command and control of um, uh, organized governmental units, but rather I assume are answerable initially to the people who pay their uh, uh, pay their paycheck. The contractors, uh, and, and I'm assuming that uh, you're addressing the question for the contractors that are armed and provide protective services. Uh, they are contractors uh, accompanying the force. Some of them are under, contra under, under contract to the coalition provisional authority. Others are under contract with non-governmental organizations that are providing humanitarian relief. They, there really was not a, um, uh, a, a policy with regard to the employment of these contractors uh, in, in uh, Iraq or Afghanistan until just recently. The Department of Defense has drafted uh, a directive and an instruction that implements 
that uh, goes into greater, deep, very great detail about how these contractors are going to be treated, how the uh, what the uh, the specifications of work uh, can can require of them, and and the uh, when they can be armed and under what conditions they can use force to defend themselves or others. And as a as a practical matter, contractors are should not be in. A, uh, a combat zone. Now the problem is that we are now in a, a stability operation where, where insurgencies are flaring up uh, in, in Fallujah and other places throughout Iraq. Um, the, the policy is essentially going to say that contractors can only use force to defend themselves. They cannot put themselves in a position of engaging in offensive operations. And as soon as possible, as soon as they can, uh, they can be extracted from, uh, let's say, Fallujah, as an example, uh, they, they've got to get out of Dodge. Uh, now, that, that directive has been in, in draft for a few months now. And it, it precedes the, uh, the events that are, are currently going on over in Iraq. But it addresses a number of those issues. Michael? Um, this is a uh, question for uh, Ken Watkin. Um, wondering whether the Canadian Department of National Defense has taken a position yet on the American creation of a third category, i.e., combatant, non combatant, unlawful combatant, um, and whether or not any thought has been given to uh, Canada's obligations with respect to transfer to U.S. forces of individuals if there's a problem with that third category. Yeah, not only is just the, the uh, Department of National Defense's uh, position, like at the time when this first arose back in early 2002, uh, the Government of Canada took a position uh, with respect to uh, the testimony before parliamentary committees by, uh, by uh, foreign affairs officials who acknowledged the uh, concept of the exact term when it was um, clearly, we have transferred, and the government of Canada indicated, indicated it was fully willing to do so with the recognition of the U.S. willingness to apply its international obligations. As far as that law, if you're asking me, is there such an idea or concept of, of the uh, unprivileged belligerent? And I think it's quite simple, yes. If you just need to look back at the Nuremberg Judgment in the Hostages trial, which uh, looked at the question of uh, well, killing the hostages in relation to the activities of a number of resistance movements uh, that happened during World War II. There was a clear recognition there of what they called unlawful belligerency, which, which was the issue of what the status was of resistance movements in former Yugoslavia and uh, other areas of Europe. And this issue of unprivileged belligerency has been, a long, has been around as long as there's been an armed conflict. And I suggest one of the problems in this area is an over-reliance on uh, Black Letter Law in Geneva Convention 3, and even additional Protocol 1, and the requirement to look at some of the other issues. The Kieran case is a clear example, and the other uh, case made reference to the Kieran case, and the, uh, and the analogy of uh, unprivileged belligerency, the spying, and other activities of uh, sabotage. And, uh, and uh, you know, if, if I've, I've commented before, they, it all makes quite strange bedfellows when you think of who falls within the unprivileged belligerency framework. Um, you have uh, spies, you have uh, uh, regularly uniformed members of the armed forces who will be on enemy lines to conduct sabotage. You've got unrecognized non-state actors who are involved in armed conflict. And certainly the internet can see someone write an article on the legal status of many of the resistance movements in uh, World War II, which prompted, a, uh, prompted in the judgment of the hostages case, in fact, the recognition that you may be doing something, it's not illegitimate under international law to be doing what you're doing, uh, in this case the, uh, the resistance movements, but in fact maybe contrary to the law of the capital <coughs> power, which to me is a clear recognition of the concept of the resistance. Ken, let me, let me follow up on that, uh, because all those precedents going all the way back to the Nuremberg Tribunal, of course, were totally within the context of what we would say is a recognized armed conflict. And <laughs> that's why of, uh, the, the Supreme Court cases have been mentioned, but for everyone who is not aware of 
there are three major cases to be argued before the United States Supreme Court uh, this month. <clears throat> the Guantanamo Bay cases, which were Rosal v. Bush and Oda v. Bush, which will decide one question, one question only, is there jurisdiction in our federal courts to review the detentions? Then there are the other two cases, which are distinct, uh, Hamdi and Padilla, which are two American citizens uh, who are being held in military detention as unlawful combatants without the possibility of uh, seeing, a, seeing an attorney or ever being charged. Uh, I think the Padilla case raises the real question of uh, uh, Padilla being captured in Chicago O'Hare's airport, uh, not on the battlefield of Afghanistan, as was Hamdi. And, and the, the real question, Ken, I would put to you is, can you translate all those precedents of unlawful belligerency into this new war on terrorism, however you define it? And, and in, in a number of different ways, I think you can and you have to. And, and one, of the, uh, one of the true challenges, I don't want to comment on the U.S. case that's going before the, the Supreme Court and the exact details of that, but one, one of the challenges for international lawyers, if I see it, is trying to fit what has developed a very, in, in the minds of the courts and trying to, you know, trying to put order and chaos that, that is our conflict. Neat, neat concepts of international armed conflict, uh, armed conflict not of international character, trying to establish when common article three of the Geneva Protocols arise, and is that, a, is that a lower threshold because we want to get humanitarian rules into conflict? Uh, is, that, is that a lower threshold than Geneva Protocol two in the Civil War? And then of course you have the challenge of how the law enforcement paradigm of the emergency interfaces with non-international armed conflict. What it's, what it's really done is, is put a challenge to the state-based concept of order, you know, because you have non-state actors capable of transnational <coughs> order. And uh, you know, like when you look in the literature, you see this mass of, uh, of different opinions. And at the end of the day, uh, what happened was your, na your nation, our nation, and a number of other, large number of other nations uh, reacted to what was seen as an armed attack, which is the threshold of international law for armed conflict, uh, and react to that with the campaign against the Al-Qaeda and um, the Taliban. And, and now much of that can be put in the context of there was a state, so it's a bit easier to do that in the state-centered uh, idea. But that, that same threat still exists as I, as I not only, you know, in the U.S., because I see all the alerts, the same people, and the same threat, you know, maybe, uh, maybe they have some factors, uh, but also th that same threat exists in Canada. And, uh, and uh, you know, the first, the first case, the Caroline case, which is the uh, fundamental case of international humanitarian law and self-defense, involved a Canada-U.S. dispute of which the non-state actors were on the American side of the border. And it's always been this challenge. Just uh, contradict uh, Ken uh, on, uh, on the unprivileged belligerent issue. Uh, obviously, this concept exists since a long time. Uh, in particular, at the time when there was no forced Geneva Convention, no convention protecting civilians. Then, simply if you fell out of the protection of the Prisoner of War Convention, you have no protection, and therefore, at that time, I would agree with the Curing case of the Supreme Court simply, and in Europe, there was no forced Geneva Convention. Since 1949, there is a forced Geneva Convention where we have a definition of the persons protected by that convention. Persons are those who, at a given moment, in any manner whatsoever, find themselves in case of a conflict in the hands of a party to the conflict or an occupying power of which they are not national. Now, this has been deliberately formulated in the way to make it watertight. Everyone who is under Convention 3 is under Convention 4. Uh, and now you would say yes, but we have to adapt it to new challenges. Um, and don't take black letter law, that's civil law approach like Quebec and Europe. But uh, simply, let's Let's play it with the Fort Geneva Convention. They are protected civilians, obviously. And there the term unprivileged belligerence is completely right to recall us that if a civilian participates, it is an unprivileged belligerent because a civilian has no right to directly participate in hostilities. Therefore, such civilian may be punished. 
first thing. Second thing, sometimes you cannot punish that person because you don't have evidence for courts and so on. And for that, the Fort Geneva Convention has the possibility of interning civilians for up to six months and repeating it for six months for imperative security reasons. And so these are kind of guys. Why couldn't uh, there be an uh, administrative board set up by the United States according to a regular procedure without fair trial, simply deciding you individually, you are a security threat? Why do they have to take a common decision uh, on all those people without a minimum of uh, fair procedure, which the US expected Israel to apply to Palestinian terrorists. And it's interesting, the greatest criticism to this US policy is previous US State Department reports about Israel, which criticized certain uh, policies of Israel towards terrorists, including deliberate targeting of terrorists. Why don't I just suggest that we'll agree to disagree on this? Do we have any more comments or questions? In the back. It's a question for Mr. Walsh. Uh, can the U.S. by a national or uh, by a national planning group recently negotiated cross-border consequence management efforts between the two countries? Were there any legal obstacles involved in those negotiations that had to be overcome? And I'm thinking specifically of if a provincial premier or a governor uh, calls upon uh, a military force for aid of civil power, is there any difficulty in, through these arrangements on calling on the uh, forces of a uh, foreign country to bring you in as aid of civil power? Or were there any other legal difficulties involved with having, let's say, Canadian troops operating on American soil, that possibility, or vice versa? By way of background, the Binational Planning Group uh, is an organization about which you, you will hear uh, some, some this evening and quite a bit tomorrow. So I, I won't uh, go into great detail, other than to say that we are still negotiating the civil assistance plan. There is an existing basic security document between the United States and the government of Canada that deals with uh, essentially armed conflict for the most part. And uh, it, it, it's... Uh, it kind of complements the, the NATO treaty as well as uh, the NORAD agreement. Um, it's old, it, it uh, doesn't quite address the current situation in which we find ourselves, the current threat. So it is uh, the, the basic security document uh, as implemented by two separate plans uh, is still under construction. Civil assistance plan is, is the one that you're talking about. U.S. military forces could possibly uh, provide support to the Canadian military in, uh, in a uh, humanitarian disaster, uh, uh, natural disaster of some type, or maybe even in response to uh, uh, consequence management, weapons of mass destruction uh, use in, in Canada. Um, yet there are, there are a number of issues that, uh, that we're still working through, and we're in about the second draft of the plan, I think. Uh, it, and we're looking or having some type of a, a final document, I believe in the, is it in the fall of this year. Captain Pam McClune is a Navy captain who is uh, the legal advisor to the Binational Planning Group. She does that full time. And, uh, and that's, uh, that, that is the current uh, project that we're, we're trying to accomplish. And then after we figure out how to provide support cross-border to the Canadian military, then we will uh, work on the, uh, a common defense plan, uh, which is the, uh, you know, the, the homeland defense part of, uh, of the puzzle. That, uh, the, the Binational Planning Group's charter was scheduled to, uh, to run out in December of this year. There's a very good chance that it will be extended uh, for up to, two, uh, up to two years, perhaps. So they recognize the, uh, the importance of this initiative, but also the complexity in, uh, in Give us a little more time to get it done. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one last question, Robbie. I didn't intend to say anything, but uh, so man, I, I didn't intend to say anything. This is Admiral Robertson, by the way. Uh, Professor Robertson, Duke Law School of Americans. Uh, 
comment, it's not a question, it's a comment. Uh, Professor Sosoe uh, spoke briefly, and he sort of tossed it out of the sidebar, uh, as to how customary international law is formed. Uh, and I grant that there may be a difference between the way the United States looks at it and how others do. But it is, in the view of most uh, international lawyers, formed by the practice of states. And what professors or others say at conferences such as this does not constitute practice of law, as you suggest. Uh, it may help in interpreting it, perhaps, but it's the state practice, it's what states do, what they say in their official capacity. But beyond that, I don't think you're creating customary international law. Thank you. We'll, we'll leave that as the final comment. Uh, and join me in thanking the panel this afternoon. For those of you who will be joining us tonight to hear Major General Reese, who is the Chief of Staff of both uh, NORAD and U.S. Northern Command, uh, the reception will start outside at 6.30 with dinner to follow afterwards, and we look forward to seeing you later in the afternoon and the early evening. I think anything uh, we need to say other than that? What about leaving materials in the room? Should they take them with them? Uh, probably, yes. Okay. Uh, it probably is uh, safer for you to take materials with you to make sure that the cleaning crews do not uh, sweep up your notes. So we will see you tonight, if not tonight, tomorrow morning. <laughs>